thank you for that very generous welcome. How's everyone doing tonight? Okay, how's everyone doing tonight? Good, good. Uh, I always enjoy my uh, time in Little Rock, so I'm very, very happy uh, to be back. Uh, my name is Alex Holland. I am the lead community placemaker at an engineering company called McClure. I'm not an engineer, so please don't ask me any engineering questions. Um, but I'll explain why I work for an engineering company uh, shortly. But what I do is creative placemaking. How many of you have heard of the phrase creative placemaking before? That's awesome. Okay, good bit of you. Um, creative placemaking is still a relatively new term that was coined about 10 years ago by the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and essentially, creative placemaking is all about spurring economic development and population growth uh, through the creation of cultural and entrepreneurial amenities. But over the last 10 years, Creative placemaking has been largely employed in more urban areas. And when I say urban areas, I mean places with populations of 500,000 or more people in the metro areas. Seeing a need for this type of work in less densely populated areas, our placemaking team at McClure primarily focuses on providing creative placemaking uh, services to rural communities all across the country. Uh, we only work in communities with populations of 50,000 or less, but our uh, main target area is working with populations of 20,000 or less. In fact, we've even worked in a community as small as 236 people. We started our work in communities across the Midwest, but we have branched out into the Mississippi River Delta region and beyond. In fact, we'll begin our first international project next month. Um, so during our time together this evening, I want to talk a little bit more about what creative placemaking is and how it can be employed in rural communities across Arkansas, uh, throughout the country, and perhaps in some of your hometowns. How many of you are from a rural community? 50,000 or less. Great. So several of you. And I know I was just introduced, but I want to share a little bit more uh, about myself before I begin and how I got into um, this line of work. So uh, I was born in the very rural community that is Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, and by the look I'm seeing on your faces, I know exactly what you're thinking. I'm, I'm here to confirm people do live in Vegas. But I get this question all the time. So you actually lived in Vegas, Vegas? They always say it twice. I still haven't figured out how to answer that question, but I think what they mean is, did you live in a hotel and casino or a house? I lived in a house, okay? <laughs> Pretty normal. I used to get that question all the time when I was a kid. Um, but my first job was actually in retail. I uh, started in uh, the stockroom organizing merchandise, and eventually, when I was nine years old, my uncle let me work the cash register. Um, the compensation for all of my hard work during that time was a Beanie Baby and a McDonald's kids meal. Um, I thought that was a pretty good deal at the time, but now I'm realizing that's cheap child labor and it's probably illegal. By 2007, we had expanded to six retail stores across the Las Vegas Valley, and by 2011, we had none. I learned a lot of valuable lessons during that time but what I really learned was what it was like to be a small business owner, even if just indirectly, during the time of the Great Recession. I always knew I needed to leave Vegas, as much as I loved home, and over the course of my childhood, I watched Vegas flourish with a booming economy and extreme population growth. In fact, by the time I was heading off to college, uh, Vegas had tripled in size. You can see that's the same photo. It also led the nation in foreclosures. I knew it was time to leave. So instead of going to school in LA or San Francisco, New York City, like many of my high school classmates did, I decided to do something really radical. I packed my bags and traveled 1,500 miles away from the comforts of my hometown to really unfamiliar territory. I knew no one. I moved to Monroe, Louisiana, where I attended the University of Louisiana Monroe and played soccer for the university and graduated with four degrees. 
Yes, four degrees. I said that correctly. Um, I couldn't get myself to leave Northeast Louisiana. I was actually planning on going to law school after my four years, and I was going to head back to the West Coast. That clearly didn't happen. So after seven and a half years of living in the South, I'm sure my mom figured she'd be supporting me for the rest of my life as I pursued lifelong education at ULM. Um, but fortunately for my mom and her bank account and probably her sanity, I actually accepted a position with the Delta Regional Authority where I focused my efforts um, on federal affairs and program development. And how many of you are familiar with DRA? I show hands. Okay, a lot of you, so I'm not going to dig into what we do. Um, but there I managed several programs um, addressing economic and community development. But my favorite uh, program was the Delta Creative Placemaking Initiative. I was fortunate to work alongside a lot of these cross-sector partners here to support creative placemaking activities um, all across the Delta region with the sole purpose of creating better places for people to live, work and play. But to increase the capacity of rural communities to do this work, we decided to host six regional workshops across the region where we brought together local leaders and community champions, but also placemaking practitioners from all across the country to meet each other, to learn from one another, and to brainstorm together. We went to community, well, I guess we went to Wilson, Arkansas as well. We went to communities as small as 855. Um, we trained 500 public, private, and nonprofit leaders and received 108 grant applications for this program. We had $309,000 worth of seed funding to get out. Um, Fortunately for me, though, three of those applications were deemed ineligible, so it made the selection process so much easier. <laughs> um, we awarded 15 communities across the region with seed grants supporting everything from asset mapping to strategic planning to rural business incubators and to restoring historic theaters. And at the conclusion of that initiative, I knew this was it. I knew this is it because rural regions need to invest in their place, in their communities, before they can realize tangible and sustainable economic development success. I was sure of it. But as a nation, we suffer from this urban-rural divide, regardless of if it is real or just perceived. Having lived in both urban and rural, and having enjoyed both, I seek to alleviate and remedy this divide in my work today. The many urban individuals see images like this when they think of rural America. They see dilapidation and decay, and you can't entirely blame them because they, they read about these images in books and they see these images in movies Perhaps they see these images in real life, and it is certainly consumed in the news with these images. And unfortunately, rural America has become synonymous with these words. Just fill in the blank. Rural America is poor, uneducated, discriminatory, unhealthy, hopeless. Last year, the Wall Street Journal published this article titled, Rural America is the New Inner City. We don't believe rural America is a new inner city. We believe rural America is the next frontier. We see untapped potential and incredible opportunity, but perspective is everything. This narrative shift won't happen on its own. And that is why we specifically focus on doing creative placemaking in rural communities only. At McClure, we want to build strong communities from start to finish, and we know that we cannot do that with just civil engineering alone. So we like to consider our placemaking team social engineers, striving to make rural communities better places to live. Everywhere we go, we start with this question. Does your community need more people? For many communities that we visit and work in, the answer is typically yes. We don't believe rural America has a job shortage, and I know that is an uncommon opinion. We believe rural America has a people shortage. 
This belief is evidenced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics who recently released data that says there are more job openings today in America than there are job seekers. We have a people shortage. Yet many rural communities are still fixated on the old school economic development model, throwing millions of dollars in incentives to entice a company to come to their town, even if this company might not create the jobs that they claim they will. Incentivizing companies to relocate to our towns is not necessarily a bad thing, but on its own, it's no longer working. Companies are incentivized to move to towns that look like this instead of the former, and regardless of size, companies want to see towns that are vibrant, that have occupied storefronts, and steady foot traffic, and the reasoning is pretty simple. Companies want to open for business in towns like this because they believe they can keep their leadership and their employees there. And the concept of investing in place is no way groundbreaking. But even still, it has taken time for the economic development field to catch up with this. Fortunately, the International Economic Development Council published this report last year called Place Matters. And in it, IEDC called for an evolving approach to economic development. Place matters today if we want communities, if, if communities want to attract the workforce of tomorrow. I want to repeat that. Place matters today if communities want to attract the workforce of tomorrow. But before we can consider what it means to make our com communities more desirable places to live, every community has these top two concerns. Workforce development and housing stock. Every community, regardless of size, has a housing shortage. Whether it be single family homes or modern apartments, whether it be places for sale, places for rent. And every community has challenges with their workforce, whether it be a lack of skilled workers or too many open jobs and not enough workers to fill them. So this is where our work begins. When we think about the next generation of workforce, we need to ask these three questions. What do young people want? How do we get young people to move here? And how do we get young people to stay here? When you ask young people what they want, I can almost guarantee that they will likely say one of these things. They want mountains, they want oceans, or they want a professional sports team. And I bet they would want the Vegas Golden Knights, but maybe I'm just biased. So since none of those things, or well, maybe some, if not all those things, are likely to come to a rural community anytime soon, we have to dig a little bit deeper. Before choosing to move to a new community, young people also want an arts and cultural scene. And in Little Rock, there are great examples of this. They want an entrepreneurial environment. They want parks and recreation. They want smart transportation. And that doesn't necessarily mean public transportation. It just means smart transportation. And they want jobs. I said jobs last for a reason. Because young people today are no longer moving to communities simply to take a job. They're moving to communities first because they are desirable places to live. And after moving, then they look for a job. This isn't everybody but it's a lot of young people today and the trend is gonna to continue to grow. I worked very closely with a student at the University of Alabama who was going through our graduate program and she had a full-time job at the university, um, was living in Tuscaloosa, was from a small town in Alabama, so Tuscaloosa was a really big city for her. And I heard recently that she was moving to Nashville. So last time I saw her a couple months ago, I said, hey Lauren, heard you're moving to Nashville. What exciting things are you gonna do in Nashville? She said, I don't know, but I found this awesome apartment downtown. She then proceeded to tell me that she maybe had a potential interview a few weeks after she settled down. Lauren is not the oddball in this situation. This is happening with young people all across the country. I talk a lot about the younger generation. We can break this up into these three age brackets and something we've learned is that the first group and last group typically want the same things, they just do them at different times of the day. Some people want to grab a drink, 
get a bite to eat and go to a movie or a show between the hours of 4 and 8 p.m. Others want to do that between 8 p.m. and 1 in the morning. So we don't just focus on the next generation, but we need to understand that we have to place very special emphasis on this age group for various reasons. Let's shift gears and talk about housing. The housing shortage has impacted every community across America and the rural housing crisis is increasingly becoming worse. For years, rural communities have suffered from stagnant wages and plant closures. Couple that with minimal amenities and the cost to build continue to rise, resulting in the lack of available housing options. Take a look at this. The average rent for a one bedroom apartment in rural America is $525 per month. But if a developer elects to build a brand new one bedroom apartment, they need to charge $975 in order to make their money back and maybe a little bit of profit. That's a massive delta. Consider this, the average price of single family home in rural America is $72,000. Again, if a developer wants to build a brand new single family home, three bedrooms, they need to list for $185,000. These cost disparities are widening and it's only making the rural housing crisis worse. But there are communities out there that are coming up with really innovative solutions to alleviate this problem. Let's take a look at Newton, Iowa. Newton, Iowa has about 15,000 people living there, 45 minutes outside of the Des Moines metro. The city was convinced that they could sell single family homes, but they couldn't find a developer to build. So here's what they did. They said to the developer, we, the city of Newton, will take out the loan for you to build. We want you to build 10 homes in the first year. Any of those homes that you don't sell, we, the city of Newton, will buy those homes from you. Seeing no risk, the developer agreed. Then they knew they had to go incentivize the home buyer. So they said, any of these lots that you purchase and then build a home worth more than $160,000, we, the city of Newton, are gonna give you $10,000 cash. Most people use that as their down payment, but you could use it as you wish. They gave them a year's worth of tickets to the Iowa Speedway, year's membership to the YMCA, and a brand new lawnmower. It's a pretty good deal. Who wants to move to Newton, Iowa now? No one? Do you still want to stay here? No, that's okay. In year one, all 10 homes sold. In year two, 10 more sold. Right now, they are building 20 more. This can be replicated anywhere. And it is all about attraction and retention of new residents. How can you incentivize developers and people to come to your town? Here's another idea. Some companies are providing their employees with monthly housing stipends or down payment assistance to incentivize them to live closer to the office. Why do companies care about their employees living closer to the office? Because evidence shows that productivity goes up and absenteeism goes down. Addressing workforce development and housing stock are key to success, but what differentiates one community from another is actually their amenity offerings. This is a list of what every American city with a, a million or more people have to offer its residents. Smaller cities typically have less than this and rural communities have very few of these. Some rural communities have none of these to offer. So we have to find a way to bridge that gap and create something that is truly unique in our communities. Check out this graph. This is a graph of microbreweries in America from 1887 through 2013. You'll notice in 2013, there were more than 2,500 microbreweries across the country. That's significant, and it's also the most we've ever had until 2016, when that number doubled. Now we have more than 5,000 microbreweries all across the country. I don't bring this up because drinking beer is fun, and it is. But it's important to consider the entrepreneurial culture that microbreweries create. Microbreweries are also economic drivers in many of the communities that they exist in. The photo on the screen is actually from a, actually, you know what, we're gonna guess. Does anyone know where that brewing company is located? 
Doesn't look like it. Water Valley, Mississippi. 3,500 people live in Water Valley, Mississippi. This is a list of what entrepreneurs and artists and creatives are looking for when they're thinking about where they want to live. All of these things are pretty low cost to build and maintain, and we help create these things in rural communities across the country. Consider this example. The Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, located in Omaha, Nebraska, has an internationally renowned artist in residence program. Every three months, 12 visual artists from across the globe come down to downtown Omaha, Nebraska, and while there, the artists are provided housing, they're also provided studio space and materials at no cost. At the end of their 90-day residency, they exhibit to the public, and then they leave. What happens when they leave? They go back home, wherever they're from, and they tell their family and friends how awesome downtown Omaha is. This program has a seven-year international waiting list. There are artists in Paris right now that have applied to this program and will not get in for seven years. Let that sink in. When we go into a community, we try to create multidisciplinary spaces, especially if they are a nonprofit. And most nonprofits today cannot survive on grants and fundraising alone. Many try, but they can't. It's not sustainable. They need different revenue models. We need to figure out a way for nonprofits to generate revenue through mixed use facilities. So, our recommendation for a nonprofit is to have a revenue model that is 70% generated revenue and 30% grants and fundraising. Many nonprofits today, it's the other way around. Let's consider these two spaces in red font here. Oops. What is this? Say it a little bit louder. It's not your question. It's a shipping container. It's a shipping container located in downtown Memphis. But it's also a STEM classroom and a makerspace fully equipped with computers and 3D printers and Wi-Fi. Wilson, you see in the corner of the photo, is the CEO of this company called Building Box, and he has designed these shipping containers to be dropped anywhere in the country and even outside of the country to provide very basic technological services and STEM classes to kids in rural and underserved areas. Right now, Memphis has 45,000 opportunity youth, people who are ages 18, to, was it 26, 18 to 26, 18 to 24, who are out of school and out of work. He's working with some of these youth right now, and he can't do it alone, but he sure, he sure is trying. These kids right now are actually learning how to code, and companies like FedEx, who have got, done away with their two and four year degree requirements, are actually taking kids who have been certified in coding. Our colleagues at the Center on Rural Innovation, better known as CORI, are actually creating innovation hubs beginning in a small rural community in Vermont. And by their definition, an innovation hub is near a university, provides high-speed fiber, incorporates a center for entrepreneurs and tech training, has attractive loft apartments and nearby cultural institutions. Corey believes innovation hubs will attract young professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives to rural areas. Sound familiar? Rural communities all across the country have old historic buildings that look like this. But what if these buildings were occupied instead of vacant or underutilized? What kind of people could they attract with an affordable cost of living and quality housing options and unique cultural amenities? This is some of what we do and these are some of the things that we create. Restaurants, breweries, daycare facilities, hopefully not next to each other, housing, co-working spaces, business incubators. We seek to build community through these cultural and entrepreneurial amenities, but how do we do it? Everything we do is community driven and locally led. Ultimately, we come into communities and then we leave. If it's not locally driven, it will not happen. And this is the only way creative placemaking concepts are implemented and sustainable. 
This is a community visioning session that we held in Stanton, Iowa. Population 637 people, 175 people showed up to provide their input. It's more than 27% of the population and they are successfully fundraising for their capital campaign as we speak to implement. After compiling quantitative and qualitative data and input, we assess the project concepts that are most desired by the communities, um, but that are also feasible. And our final product is a comprehensive placemaking action plan that includes these elements, specific amenities and where they will be located, what type of programming, and who will own and operate these buildings, how much it will cost up, up front, and how much it will cost to operate over three years, and where the funding will come from. This is where we are working right now in 15 states and 25 communities all across the country. Soon we'll be deeper in Appalachia and the West and even Canada. Let's take a look at a project that we recently completed. Welcome to Atmore, Alabama, population 10,022. Our project began with the historic Strand Theater that you see on the screen, but we knew that the restoration of an old historic theater was not enough to revitalize Main Street. So after many months of negotiation with the property owner, we actually identified the buildings on both sides of the Strand Theater, and we convinced him to let us create a plan of action to put our project concepts in those buildings. After lots of grumbling and complaining that he had to move all of his stuff out of there since he used it as storage, and let me tell you, he used all of that real estate for storage, he finally agreed. In our plan, we redesigned the Strand Theater to return to its former glory. It's one of the oldest theaters in Alabama. In the building to the left of the theater, we're creating a pizza parlor and a bakery with a kids' interactive zone so parents could come eat while their parents or their kids play in a safe space. On the top, we're creating a maker space for all ages to participate in and enjoy. And on the building to the right of the theater, we created a live music venue and event space fully equipped with a bar and an outdoor patio. On top, we have two makeshift classrooms, a sound recording studio, a large dance studio, and an artist residency studio. Right now, or sorry, over the course of that five-month planning process, 11 new businesses opened up on their main street. That's more than the preceding 10 years combined. For context, Atmore is fundraising on their $3 million capital campaign to implement their projects and they are well on their way. But how do we pay for all this stuff? Like most people, we use a mix of public and private dollars to implement our economic and community development projects. But we place a really great deal of emphasis on tax credits of various forms and private dollars as opposed to public dollars. But we really need them both. Pay close attention to those words in red. Most communities are unwilling to ask these people for help. But these entities are very reliant on rural communities to either sustain their population or grow their population. We urge rural communities to ask them to make investments in their, into their communities because oftentimes they will. And we also often see that rural communities don't ask for enough money. They think asking for $5,000 for their capital campaign is enough, and we encourage them to ask for a million. What if they knock you down to half a million? It's more than 5,000. Previously mentioned that the traditional economic development model is broken, and I truly believe it is. Rural communities continue to throw incentives at companies to relocate and create new jobs, but I want to challenge that. Why don't we incentivize people to move to our communities, especially when we do have available jobs and when remote work options today are more feasible than ever before. But if we want the next generation to come to rural, we need to incentivize them, just like companies. And we can do that through the creation of residency programs and talent incentive models. And we can do that for any group that you want to attract, young professionals, welders, doctors, teachers, police officers, you name it. Here's an example. 
let's pool together some private money, say $100,000. We can incentivize 10 individuals to move to our rural communities with $100,000, and I'll show you how. We're gonna go to the companies that are having a tough time filling some of those positions, and we're gonna incentivize whoever they wanna incentivize into their towns. We're gonna to offer to underwrite rent, $200 a month, and we're also going to pay off $1,000 in student debt every year for three years. But they have to commit to live in this community for three years. After three years, if 25% say, hey, I kinda like it here, I think I'm gonna stay. Maybe they buy a house, maybe they get married, Maybe they have kids. That is more revenue into the local economy and tax base, and I will argue that that has a better return on investment over time than throwing millions and millions of dollars in tax incentives at large companies. Some states have already designed programs just like this. Take Vermont, for example. Vermont recognized that they have an aging population and a rapidly shrinking tax base. So what did they decide to do? They decided to incentivize individuals with $10,000 cash that could pay for relocation expenses and business operation expenses, and they want to fund 100 workers over the next three years, uh, and 20 more workers each year after that. Vermont doesn't even care if you take a job in state they just know that they need to incentivize rural or young people to move to their rural communities for their survival. Our placemaking team uh, closely monitors migration patterns all across America, and right now, there are young people living on the coast that are constantly asking themselves why they still live there. If they are creative, you actually have very few advantages to living in a large city because you cannot pioneer like you can in a rural community. This is a map showing the net migration patterns from 2000 to 2007. This is where people were going, and this is where people were leaving. As you can see, I was the only person who moved from Vegas to Northeast Louisiana during this time period. Many young people who have moved to the coast are now trying to find their way back to middle America. Why? These cities have become oversaturated and too expensive. And the way we define oversaturation is can you be 25 years old and live in an apartment downtown? On the coast, no way. New York City, San Francisco, LA. Young people are being pushed out of these places every single day, but where are they going? Over the next five to 10 years, we believe that we will see second-tiered cities like Austin and Denver and Nashville become oversaturated. This trend is already beginning today. And over the next 20 or 10 to 20 years, we believe that we'll see the same thing happen to third-tiered cities like Des Moines, Baton Rouge, and even Little Rock. Over the next 20 to 30 years, even smaller cities we'll see their populations increase. And if you believe this is completely out of the realm of possibilities, I want you to consider Silicon Valley 70 years ago. It was a group of small towns over apple orchards, not the apple that we know today. Steve Case, founder of AOL, is on a mission to invest in entrepreneurs throughout middle America. Did you know that 75% of all venture capital last year went to three states. Which three states were they? Who knows? California, New York, Massachusetts. The rest of the 47 states had to fight over 25% of all venture capital. It was even worse for African Americans. It was even worse for women. Rural communities doesn't even compete with them. 75% of America's talent does not live in three states. Entrepreneurs exist in every corner of this country. And Steve, along with several other big name investors, are starting to put their money where their mouth is and invest in the heartland. Take a minute to read these quotes.
By 2040, experts believe that 75% of all vehicles will be autonomous. The driverless economy is coming at an incredibly rapid pace. And this is actually my car. I drove it today, you guys can see it after. It's actually a Mercedes and I don't even own a car. Um, but driverless, the driverless economy will completely change the way we work and live. Imagine being able to work while you commute. You can live an hour away from your place of employment and not miss a beat if you have a driverless vehicle. Karen Harris summed this up perfectly when she said, individuals may opt to live further from city centers as advances in transportation and connectivity allow them the abundant space of a rural town combined with many of the employment options, goods, and services once available only in cities. So I ask you this, why is your town not the world? For me, seeing the world meant living in an urban center and moving to a small southern town. I didn't have to move to Paris to see the world. It was different and exciting. And there are more people like me than you realize. And some of them might not even know it. I didn't. I was gonna go play soccer at the University of Oregon until I changed my mind. <laughs> Consider this. More than half of the young people currently living in the Bay Area say they are going to leave in the next few years. Many of these young people are making $200,000 plus per year and with additional compensation. Many of them still have to live 90 minutes away from their place of employment. They're going to need a place to go. Businesses are also leaving. In fact, a Wall Street giant earlier this year moved its operations to New York City, or from New York City to Nashville. Even they can't afford New York City. They probably can, but they, you know, they need to move. One last thought about housing. Does anything look odd about this building besides the really obnoxious color? Take a closer look. Anything weird? What's that? Shipping boxes, okay. Actually, this is a 3,000 square foot house that was 3D printed in three hours by this machine. The way this works is pretty simple. You insert code into the printer, it spits out concrete into whatever shape that you coated it in, and this one was printed in boxes, and do you see the crane in the background? It essentially just stacked them like Legos. You can print in all different shapes and sizes. In fact, this was the first 3D printed office, um, and it's located in Dubai. This is what it looks like inside, kind of like the Jetsons. 3D printing is tremendously cheaper than the cost to build today, but it isn't being done anywhere in America. The reason? Regulations, zoning ordinances, and unions. But rural areas have a huge advantage over their urban counterparts. It will take urban areas 10 to 15 years to go through all those things and to navigate that system. For rural communities, you can probably fix a zoning ordinance in like three city council meetings, for being real. We have to prepare our communities for 30 years from now, but it has to start today. What do rural communities and what does rural America look like 30 years from now? We have to envision that and we have to, have to act on it. I wanna finish with this brief video, and this video highlights our work in Greene County, Iowa, an area with less than 10,000 people combined.
There's a great quote from Dante that says, from a little spark may burst a flame. If you care about the future of rural communities throughout Arkansas, the rest of your country, or even your hometowns, I hope you'll consider being that little spark because rural America depends on it. Thank you. Great. Good job. Thanks, guys. Uh, we got time for a few questions. Uh, yes, sir. yes, ma'am, right here. Make it back. Uh, concerning migration inland from the coasts, do you think some of the motivation for that is global warming and fear about sea level rise? Perhaps it could be. You're saying from middle America out to the coast or the opposite coast. You know, it could be, but I don't think that would be most of the populations that are moving back into the Midland. I think a lot of what you're seeing are some people who were pretty young, grew up, you know, grew up, went to the coast for school. Maybe they took a job and are now looking to settle down and are wanting to move back closer to the grandparents so that they can watch their kids. Great. Who else? Do you have a question, James? Yeah. Hold on. Wait, wait for the microphones. Come at you. Oh, uh, I understand. You know what? What you presented to us. I understand how that fits in with uh, your previous job at DRA. Uh, how does uh, your current? How does uh, McClure fit in? And how do they? I assume it's a it's a pro, it's a for profit uh, yes, entity. We, yes. And, and how does that work out? And, I mean, um, where does the um, it's a great for profit question. come together with a looks like a non profit. What with with DRA? Well, I mean, no, not DRA, but I mean the, the work you're talking mm -hmm. about that is usually done by non profits. It looks like the kind of non profit. Oh, work. I see what you're saying. Good question. And but so, so this looks like the intersection of the two. Right. So um, McClure is a for profit civil engineering company. And our president um, was pretty innovative when he decided early last year that we needed to do something different other than civil engineering. So um, when we work with a lot of communities, we personally keep our rates very low when it comes to working on action plans for rural communities because we understand the populations that we serve. We also don't only create nonprofits. There are a lot of times that we do create an umbrella nonprofit to then have for-profit tenants within their building to make sure they're sustainable because a lot of art space and cultural amenities do kind of require that nonprofit umbrella arm. Um, but we also create a lot of small businesses and we work with entrepreneurs in, in a lot of these communities who may not have known they were an entrepreneur who are doing a lot of their work in their home. And we tried to give them a place that they can afford and they can start to grow um, in some of these uh, old buildings that we end up restoring. Does that answer your question? Here we go, right here. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so, how long do you stay in a community? Uh, when you get into a community that has none of this work been done before, from visioning to creating the plan to cre getting all the stakeholders together, getting the money together to implement the plan, mm -hmm. how long does that typically take in your 25,000 or so of community? Um, so we typically take three to four trips to the community. So we don't actually live in the communities ourselves, but we'll spend say three or four days with the community to do community visioning sessions. And we start our process with a steering committee, but it's not your traditional steering committee with just local elected officials and business leaders and they wrap that up in a, into a steering committee. We also want entrepreneurs and artists and young people, high school students, college students, people who have lived there their whole lives, people who just moved to the area, Area. Um, and then we ask them to invite five to seven people to community visioning sessions. So we'll do about three of those um, over the course of that first trip. And then we'll come back a second time to have meetings with um, building owners that were, you know, properties that we're looking at. So we need to establish which buildings we're going to be able to use. Um, potential investors, we already want to start to build their um, interest into some of these projects. We meet with nonprofits and all sorts of stakeholders who would actually be using these buildings. Maybe they're entrepreneurs, maybe they're existing uh, small business owners. And then we have to do a lot of the work as far as creating the business models for each of these amenities. And sometimes we'll have to take a, a third trip to, you know, do that 
do that over again, and then we present our final action plan. But typically, through that process, the local community is pretty empowered and kind of understands what we're doing. So they really start to take a lot of this work on their own. As far as the implementation uh, phase, we don't always stick with communities for the fundraising. We will advise them within the plan. Some communities will then hire us um, on a retainer to advise throughout the fundraising process. But ultimately, those people are in those meetings asking for money, not us, because we don't live there. And that's not sustainable, and that's our model. Of the 25 communities we've worked in, only two have asked us to come and help fundraise because they felt confident enough after the planning process to do that on their own. And that initial piece, have you identified that initial group that eventually will convene the other stakeholders? When well, you're not from the town, you've never been there, mm -hmm. so you're saying you get there, you parachute into the town, mm -hmm. how do you initially identify those people? We don't. Oh. We ask, so typically um, a city will hire us, maybe it's a nonprofit, maybe it's an individual, maybe it's a business. What we advise them is within that framework of the diverse, you know, reflective of the community is what we want to see in that steering committee. We advise them to ask those people, they then submit it to us. We don't know any of these people, but we want to make sure they hit certain demographics and certain sectors. That, that's why we're saying, this, I, I, I say this is completely locally led. We don't, we don't decide who's there. Who's there. Yeah, we've got time for one more question. Sean, you got it. Hi, I'm a Clinton School student right now. My name is Sean Street. This is my first year. Thank you very much for coming and putting on the program. I found it really interesting. Um, one of the aspects that attracted me to the Clinton School was social entrepreneurship. I guess half the states have pro-benefit corporation laws where individuals can invest in organizations, exchange no equity, and claim that against their taxes. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen that as a beneficial component to these rural communities? And have there been you know, returns on investment, so to say? Sure, and I think that we're starting to, now you know, I, I'm sure you're probably familiar with opportunity zones as, as well, kind of, sort of. Well, we're starting, you know, the opportunity zones are kind of like new markets tax credits where, you know, really wealthy individuals can essentially invest in like a CDFI or some other type of intermediary that will then invest in um, designated low census tracts and opportunity zones are kind of similar. So we do work with all uh, those types of investment. Uh, as far as seeing the uh, return on investment, we're still pretty new. So so a lot of the communities that we're working in, I'd say I think we only have four or five that are completely uh, finished with their project amenities because what we say is our planning process takes three to six months, but then it takes 12 to 18 months to implement. These are not things that we want to see five years from now. We want to see everything within two to three years. So a lot of our projects are just starting to come to fruition and most of our other communities are in the fundraising uh, phase right now. So I will answer that question in about three or four years and let you know. Well, let's thank Alex very much for me. It was a great program.